It's an obvious <laughs> casting. I don't know why I didn't think of it. Okay. Well, okay. Is it possible to keep the mic on so I can hear people in the house? Yeah, let's let's try it, and then if it if it creates some noise, I'll just mute it. So now you're now everyone, you should be able to hear everyone now. Right. Okay. Uh, I wanted to do a quick introduction of you. Not that anyone here needs an introduction of you, but I um, want to say that we asked you, you. You've done so much work around the role of the playwright in the American theater. And of course, it starts well before your book about artistic home, um, you know, in the late 80s, but you've really been um, uh, somebody who's been asking all of the hard <coughs> questions, and certainly the work that you've done over the course of, um, you know, an enormously long career is one of the many things that led to this residency program. So you're very much at the heart and soul of it, your work and your, your passion. Um, and, um, and I know you're in the middle of um, a big, huge transition uh, from um, running New Dramatists uh, to now being the executive director of the School of Drama at the University of Washington. Did I get that title right? Executive director? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, and so, um, uh, and, and, and it's, uh, we're so appreciative that you've kind of take, you've taken this opportunity to just spend a little bit of time with us at this very busy unpacking moment in your life um, to set the stage for our two days together. So we're gonna have um, the rest of today and all day tomorrow uh, together talking about these playwright residencies and you very um, graciously have offered um, to, to just get us started. So with that, I'm gonna um, thank you and, and turn it over to you. Thank you, Molly. And hi, everybody. I, Vijay, I think it is probably left to turn that off because I'm very much so that going this even freakier than speaking into my computer. Um, I, uh, I just want to say hi to everybody. It, I, you look so great to me um, as I'm from far away, and I, I see you all, all these people I know and love uh, and admire, and some new people there who I haven't met before. Um, uh, but uh, I'm really happy to be talking to you today. And I'm coming to you from my new office at the University of Washington in the very sunny and very beautiful Seattle. <laughs> I've never given an address on Skype before, so I don't really know how to think about audience online except to address you as my friends and partners in this hopeful experiment that the visionary folks at Mellon and HowlRound have la launched. Uh, I'm jealous of the great company that you're in, and jealous because you're the heart of this experiment, and I have to be on the outside looking in through this little hole at the top of my screen. I'm grateful to you, too, because the rest of us in the theater are potentially beneficiaries of your attempts. Uh, as Polly suggested, I have a lot to say on the subject of artistic homes, and I worry that there's nothing I can tell you that you don't already know especially since some of you have been in this conversation with me for so many years, maybe starting when I met Howard Chalowitz 32 years ago. Some of you are among my closest friends, and some of you owe me an email, Luis. <laughs> I've been thinking about history a lot lately. Maybe it's an inevitable part of the aging process as you watch huge spans of time collapse and seem smaller and smaller in relation to your own increased number of years. For example, the nonprofit theaters you are all part of, which once seemed to me so eternal, I now realize are all, with the exception of Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and depending on how you date at Dallas Theater Center, they are all younger than I am. And that is really young. I feel myself to be very much in process, very much uncertain. If I forgive myself for being unknowing and awkward and occasionally foolish, I must forgive theater companies for being the same. In other words, when I think about the shared history of this nonprofit art theater village we live in, I remember that it too is a recent experiment, and your residencies are an experiment within that experiment. Your experiment is part of a fix a fix made necessary by the unintended consequences of good intentions. Our theaters, brave and optimistic, cultivated a playwriting profession of greater range, depth, diversity, and imagination than any to have previously existed in this country. Then, 
Unintentionally, unwittingly, the same theaters oversaw the near impoverishment and almost total alienation of that same group of professional playwrights, alienation from the very theaters that made them possible. In other words, we are here, or you are there, and I am here, because the nonprofit theater boom, its new play energies, and the attendant spread of professional theater training programs made possible a glorious mess of playwrights with which it had no idea what to do. When Theater Development Fund published Outrageous Fortune, the result of years investigating new play production and the lives and livelihoods of playwrights, I felt I'd helped author a prosaic Greek tragedy in which characters bring about the same fate they act acted to avoid, such as the banishment or death of their own children. This is a pretty negative assessment. Some of you will disagree with it. I have some research on my side, however, as well as the pride of knowing this very residency program is designed in some measure to right those inadvertent wrongs. Now, maybe, instead of playing out a lesser tragedy, you find yourselves living in a screwball comedy, like bringing up baby or you can't take it with you, like coconuts, in which madcap playwrights run rampant through a house built on a foundation of propriety and order. <laughs> I hope you noticed that before I went all extremist and melodramatic comparing theaters to ill-fated Greeks, I made a wildly upbeat statement. The theaters you are all part of. For some of us, being a part of a theater is nothing new. For playwrights, though, I think we can agree it's fresh terrain. And there are 14 of you at the same time, actual, compensated, office, insured, budgeted, and titled playwrights with a three-year guarantee and hopes of more to come, mere strangers in what should have been your land all along. And there are 14 others of you, leaders of theaters of different stripes, dedicated to the proposition that, although the nonprofit theater made possible this generation of playwrights, it's this generation of playwrights that makes possible the future of nonprofit theater. Fourteen artistic leaders chosen for this project because you have proven that dedication over the years in action as well as words. I had a personal hit of how unusual the playwright situation is last month when my wife, the playwright Karen Hartman, and I arrived at our new, play, uh, new workplace, the University of Washington School of Drama. Karen is a senior artist in residence here. And though she's been teaching in great universities and privately for nearly 20 years, and although she arrived to find a lovely office with gorgeous leaded glass windows, empty shelving for her new books, and a new Mac laptop ordered to her specifications, the thing that really wowed her that became her iPad desktop photo was the plaque with her name on the door, a playwright's name on an office door after years of making a professional life from a converted walk-in closet at home. I, on the other hand, like the artistic directors in the HowlRound room, am used to having an office with my name on the door. So I hope that all 14 of you playwrights have actual nameplates. If you don't, ask the theaters to order one for the rest of your residency. If they can't afford it, tell them you know a funder who might help. <laughs> So all this is preamble. I've been asked to howl around for a half an hour about creating an artistic home, something I've been thinking about for a long time, and something I can't pretend to know how to do, any, uh, how anyone else should do, especially because each of your situations is so different. Each of your expectations and hopes are so particular, because the pacts you've made, theater and playwright, are so various. Moreover, the very notion of a home for an artist or group of artists is a slippery thing, and the ground keeps getting slipperier. Again, I've been thinking about history as a way of understanding where we might find ourselves now, what has changed, and how we might engage and lead responses to that change. So here's what I got. I call it a short personal history of a beautiful slippery phrase. It's got an epigraph from Anne Bogart's new book of essays, What's the Story? This is it. What distinguishes the theater from all other forms is that the theater is the only art form that is always about social systems. Every play asks, 
Can we get along? Can we get along as a society? Can we get along in this room? How might we get along better? That's from Anne. I don't know the origins of the phrase artistic home, but I have tracked it since the mid 80s. The expression came to life for me as the object of a gerund. A gerund, you probably don't remember, is the ing form of a verb, as in creating an artistic home or thinking about playwright residencies. I was groping for a title to report on the institutional theater and considering a number of verbs in the gerund form, renovating the artistic home, remaking it, rebuilding it, like that. You'll notice that each of these verbs assume that an artistic home once existed, that it only had to be rediscovered, reinvented, or refurbished. Even the article the suggested a concrete, pre-existing form. More, it suggested an agreement that there was such a thing as an artistic home, that we knew what it had been, that it had a design or a structure or a skeleton and that with enough integrity and goodwill, it could be recreated, revitalized. That was in 1986 and 87, a very different moment from our moment today. It was different because when artistic directors spoke of a theater, nine out of 10 of them meant the same thing. That is, a company with a building in a city with usually a two-headed leadership structure and a meddlesome but possibly board, uh, generous board of directors. They meant an organization in which a resident acting company was no longer possible and whose vision flowed essentially from a principal artist, usually a director. Occasionally in the year of national discussions that led to this report, there was talk of resident playwrights, but mostly that talk came from playwrights themselves, people from Richard Nelson, who shocked some of us by saying that in all the American theaters he'd ever worked, he'd never even had a desk to write at let alone, I suspect, a plaque with his name on it. It was a different time because the discussions that led to the book, The Artistic Home, grew out of a criticism leveled by the head of the NEA that there was an artistic deficit in the American theater, that the institutional tale was wagging the artistic dog. And it was a different time because we had an NEA, and few enough theaters of note that there was still a vague hope of something approaching a subsidized theater. And maybe most of all, it was a different time because the theaters, at least those who gathered around the theater communications group tables during the year-long conversations that led to the report, looked so much alike, not just in structure and intention, but also in complexion. That was then. Now the question of how to reinvigorate the art of an institution is only one of many. Some of our fellow travelers have written off the institutions altogether. They've gone their separate ways toward looser structures, smaller organizations, tighter ensembles, and more targeted missions. One of the debates that rages under this residency program is whether a foundation with playwrights on its mind should support large institutional theaters at all, especially if those theaters haven't previously shown a will to provide living wages let alone deep hospitality to playwrights. The other side argues that it's the institutions that have the capacity to make these residencies stick, to provide salaries and benefits for writers even after Mellon goes away. Mellon, in its infinite wisdom, chose to have it both ways, rewarding will and capacity, searching out large companies with the strongest track records of support and smaller ones willing to grow enough to take playwrights in for the long haul. Still, the institutional question pales beside the real question that drives our discussions nearly three decades later. Whose home is it? 30 years ago, this question was bubbling beneath the surface, but it hadn't yet broken through. It didn't yet dominate what we feebly refer to as field conversations. And with the question of whose home is it, come so many other questions. Who gets to decide? Who gets left out? Who sees herself on the stages of this so-called home? What is a stage? How can we ever be fully inclusive? Can we ever make a home together, or must our companies part company? Who do we serve? It is these questions that have led so many of the playwrights in the room 
to take leading roles in their theater's community engagement efforts. It is these questions that have forced theater administrators to look to playwrights and other individual artists to diversify their racially and economically homogeneous institutions. A lot happened to raise these questions, and playwright residencies are one attempt to answer them. The so-called culture wars happened, and a censuring Congress became a censoring one. As a direct result, funding for individual artists, notably playwrights, stopped, and for most of 20 years, stayed stopped. A lot more history conspired to bring you here. Our theaters multiplied like gremlins hitting water. Our core audiences began to age and drift and die away. Funders picking up the slack the government dropped turned limited resources towards social imperatives other than art and so came to expect more than the mere mounting of shows. You are here too because the millennial shit hit the technologically supercharged fan and everything that seemed previously knowable, institutionally containable, suddenly broke into a bajillion bits. And you are here because for decades, leading artists were working under the institutional radar in places we loosely call communities or among underserved populations demonstrating another function of art, also known as social justice. And you are here because theater administrators can't build these bridges as well as artists can. Finally, you are here because in recent history, our steadfast Western belief in the power of individual voice has been called into question. Everybody gets into the act. Everybody writes the play. Only you, shapers of words and makers of theaters, can best test this proposition. So here we are, 14 playwrights and 14 theaters, particular and various, trying to figure out how to make home. I want to suggest that after all this fast, furious history, the task has grown bigger than that. The true experiment now is how to make a society. Remember my Anne Bogart quote? What distinguishes the theater from all other art forms is that the theater is the only art form that is always about social systems. Every play asks, can we get along? Can we get along as a society? Can we get along in this room? How might we get along better? Anne is talking here about plays, but later in the essay, Politics, she goes on to write about productions. Quote, no matter how dysfunctional the characters in the play, the community of actors who perform the play must operate at the height of their abilities. The community of artists proposes, within the fabric of every production, nothing less than a model society. This is their message, unquote. A model society. This, I suggest, is your message, too. We, the witnesses and beneficiaries of your experiment within an experiment, are waiting to hear it. It may be the new definition of an artistic home. Moreover, just as the rehearsal process reveals itself in production, so the process we engage to make society is always reflected in the society we make. We are what we do, and we are how we do it. I deeply believe this. If you treat collaborators as employees, you will make hierarchical work within a stratified system. If you treat co-workers as true partners, you will, in ways implicit and explicit, model democracy. If you think a door with a name on it doesn't require you to show up and take responsibility for the success of the theater, you are squandering a gift that is the work of many people over many years. If you work with your fullest self, Take your place at the table, whatever the organizational chart suggests. You model leadership. And if you all engage with others out of a spirit of kindness, respect, and the awareness that the answer is always in someone unexpected, you will make a society that transmits cooperation, generosity, and connection, even love. This is where my personal history of the phrase has taken me to an abiding sense that our theatrical experiments are actually social ones, that while we make work, we are always making the world. And of course, as artists or sustainers of the arts, we want that, that world, our home, to be more artistic. I did when I sat in rooms as a young director, recording the words of artistic directors, feeling that they were more often invested in selling their theaters to each other 
than honestly sharing their struggles. I did during the 18 years I was trying to make an inspiring communitarian lab for writers of New Dramatists, a space for process and inquiry amid demands for product and results. I do now as I see bridges between training and scholarship and profession, root and branch, across disciplines and fields of study. I want to live in the creative thrill I felt when a room full of new dramatists read to each other, or just now listening to Adini and Andrew share their new work. I want to live in the big, obsessive, impossible ideas to which the artists among us give their lives. I want to celebrate their willingness to chase those ideas despite the personal cost. And I want to tear the theater once and for all away from the boardroom and the business school and the marketplace to lodge it back in the arts alongside painting and sculpture, literature and contemporary dance, music, both classical and new. This is how I think of artistic. Home is a different matter. Home is a place of freedom and tether self-determination and connection. Home is a place you define for yourself, maybe the only place you can own. If you don't feel ownership, it isn't home. And maybe that should be the test of a residency. Does the playwright truly feel she owns this theater home? Or is the playwright always a guest here, awaiting invitation to have a say, to play a part, to sit at the table? In the end, though, it's hard to describe a home from inside without reference to those outside. And that's tricky because we can't see the people who aren't in the room. We can know what we take for granted about the comfort of our own homes, but we can't know what other people want from it. This lack of surety has led me to a final supposition. I'm not really sure about what I'm about to say, but I think it's true, so please accept it in that tentative spirit. My thought is this, when we talk about an artistic home in 2014, we are no longer simply talking about how to welcome artists more fully into established theaters. We are talking about many other things that dominate our national debates. When we talk about artistic home, we are talking about distribution of wealth. We are talking about an economic system that has reduced our human relations to corporate and consumer relations. We are talking about a history of exclusion and bias, and even a history of domination, enslavement, and genocide. In other words, in a discussion that should be simple, should be structural, how do we create better environment for artists, in this case playwrights, we are grappling with bigger, more problematic, global, and even horrific things. These things have divided classes and races and genders of people in this culture as institutional life has grown and capitalism has advanced. You can't unearth the uses of power and domination in human history and close your eyes to them in the present, even in our own relations. And while we can't solve these global problems by creating a few gemutlich salaried positions for playwrights, we ignore this context at our own peril. Artist relations are connected to pay scale in theaters. Artist relations and the role of these artists and communities must be addressed as a way of countering our reduction of collaborators to employees and audiences to consumers. Diversity and inclusion are inseparable from what happens in a room between two people, between playwright and artistic director, between you and me. We all ride history and we all carry it. Anne Bogart reminds us the community of artists proposes within the fabric of every production nothing less than model society. This is their message. The daily act of trying to reincorporate generative artists or artists at all, other than that one artistic director, into the ongoing life of the theater is part of a bigger, naughtier, ongoing project of exploring freedom and creating democracy. Writers, in their wonderful and willful refusal to ignore the call of their own hearts, show us our capacity for freedom. Theaters, in their determination to sustain intimacy and liveness in a social context, demonstrate our will to make better society. This is what we stand to lose when our artists and theaters separate themselves from each other. This is what you stand to show by bringing them back together. 
The Mellon residencies are an experiment, and you are guinea pigs and lab rats. You are also pioneers in the middle of it all, halfway through whatever this residency thing is or is not, or maybe or hopefully will in retrospect have been. The difficulty of being at the forefront of such an experiment within an experiment is that while others learn from your mistakes or struggles, you have to suffer through them. The great thing about it is you get to share the successes and joys. We are watching you, jealously, hopefully. Thank you. It'd be yeah. better if you... It's if, one of the stranger ways I've ever asked a question in my life, but... <laughs> Maybe next year it could be like Wolf Blitzer with the 3D modeling of Todd. Um, hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm from Chicago. I'm the Chicago Commons producer. Um, so my question, and I've asked it in the context of the Commons producers before, is I'm particularly curious about this experiment happening inside the context of how playwrights currently live. So all of these amazing playwrights are having to also negotiate the lives, the artistic lives that were happening before and are gonna continue afterwards. And how that has to do with a lot of travel and a lot of being outside of the cities they're supposed to be rooted in and coming in and out of these theaters. And if you have any thoughts about how we navigate shifting cultures inside a culture that like, you know, TV shows and other kinds of commissions and just the big sort of sprawling mess that pulls a playwright in multiple directions while we also offer them a home and how, how we should think about navigating that and how on the various levels of who's inside the room. No, I <laughs> no, it's, it's like, in some ways it's the question, I think, um, from the theater point of view. Um, you know, I think one thing to remember is in the experimental context of these residencies is that they are plopped down in the middle of ongoing lives. So I, 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 I suspect that had they grown more organically out of our work over time, um, some of these questions wouldn't be at issue. But they're actually, uh, many of you, if not all of you, have chosen um, to partner with mid-career playwrights who are, have ongoing lives and have been struggling for a long time to uh, make a living in a world that doesn't provide one. And um, also, in some cases, I know um, you, you started this residency at the exact moment that a playwright who might have been waiting, I guess I'm thinking of Marquez, Scarberry, might have been waiting for years for a couple of productions, suddenly has a year with seven billion productions. Um, so these are, uh, you know, these are ongoing lives, and it's a new experiment in the middle of it. So I guess one of the things that I would say, Rebecca, is that um, uh, it is a three-year experiment, as I understand it, and it will take time for some of that stuff to sort out. I also think that it is incumbent on the playwright to um, really understand uh, the, the nature of this commitment, and that it is, you know, again, I, I, I know it's, it, this is all very grandiose, but I, I feel like um, in some ways, the future of the theater is um, one of the things at stake here, and part of that means the commitment to theater. And uh, it's a hard one, because TV has been much more hospitable to playwrights in some ways than the theater has, at least in terms of, uh, in economic terms, and even in some ways in, in terms of um, power and privilege. Um, so um, 
I think it's really important to um, make demands of your playwrights to remind them of the, uh, the, the full commitment of this project and how many of us, I mean, this is, I guess, part of my point is how many of us are um, watching and hopeful and hopeful that this really isn't a temporary uh, trial, but is actually a way of re restoring what is really historically the way theater gets made. I mean, theater gets made with playwrights and acting companies. Theater has always been made with playwrights and acting companies. The theaters that we are now part of are a historical aberration, maybe 100 years old. And so we're trying to find our ways back, and we're doing it in the middle of an ongoing life and an ongoing economic system that has required playwrights to take multiple position commissions, multiple jobs, work in, the, in TV, work in film, and travel all the time. Um, and I could, this is also why I hope that this residency program goes beyond just this pilot period, and maybe even you know, that the people at Mellon and HowlRound start thinking about now how you might see the next group of residencies so maybe people can prepare better and over a longer period of time to clear their slates and clear their lives and really um, give over, be able to give over, because I don't think it's a matter of will, I think it's a matter of simple obligation and scheduling and money, uh, be able to really give up these two years um, to be in a theater, in a place, or as much as possible. And then beyond that, I think we just kind of have to all sit down all the time and figure out how to make the most out of the time that we've got. That's my feeble uh, answer. There's something, there's something about this Skype uh, thing that I just have to point out is so untheatrical. <laughs> because I can't hear you guys when I'm talking, um, my, uh, the microphone marries off, so I don't. So. But it's the opposite of theater because you're like talking to people with no reaction, <laughs> and you're just alone by yourself in. At the University of Washington, listening to your own nasality. It's <laughs> hey, Todd, um, along those lines, first of all, every time you say anything, we laugh. Um, uh, and we're super engaged, so I, I, I know you can't feel the love in the room, but boy, can you, you know, can you do this when you laugh or something? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I do. I, I have many questions. I don't know. Uh, obviously, you're here this weekend to, to start to to raise and answer some of the, the, the questions. Um, I guess I uh, I guess I really my questions have to do with how you, uh, especially the artistic directors and playwrights, are fashioning your conversations, and. Um, you know, I, I, I suspect, uh, maybe from Rebecca's question a little bit, um, that a lot of this is around scheduling and commitment and about, you know, will we do your play? Is my play for you? That kind of thing. But I guess my um, question really has to do with how deep and honest and collaborative the conversation is around um, your partnership as artists and about these issues of ownership and place within the theater. I mean, I know some of you, I mean, Pearl, I, I, we've never met, but I've been hearing about you from Susan for years and years. So I know that you guys have this ongoing relationship, Robert and Howard, likewise, many of you. Um, but I guess I'm really curious about how you are articulating the questions yourselves and what the, and this is a big one, what do these residencies really mean other than can we house a resident playwright? And will the Mellon Foundation continue to fund this? What is the fair? 
Or You have to go here. He's over there. Yeah. You have to come right there. Yeah. The microphone's okay. here. Um, I think that that um, has been one of the more challenging things to figure out how to keep the same kind of conversation um, that I began having with Susan in the rehearsal hall um, once I became a part of the, the bigger life of the theater. Because in rehearsal, we're talking to each other as artists. So we talk all the time as artists. And that was so exciting to me. Wow, now I'm gonna be able to talk to her like this every day, but that's not true. Because she's having to talk about all the other shows that they're doing. She's having to talk about money. She's having to talk about the board and resources and renovations and all those things many of those things about which I have little or no interest. She's sitting right there, but I will say this just to you. Um, but I think that one of the things that we discovered recently, which is so obvious that I was surprised that it took us that long, um, was that when I go to her office, and I do have an office, doesn't have a plaque on the door, but it's a very nice office. Um, but when I go to her office, even though she has a table, so she comes out from behind her desk, it's the artistic director's office. So that I'm conscious of the fact that she has an assistant who is keeping time for how long we talk. I'm conscious of the fact that there's a million other things going on and emails coming in and all that, so I'm talking fast. Um, which is very different than the conversation that I want to have. So I asked her, maybe a couple weeks ago, maybe a month, can we have some conversation outside of your office, outside of my office? Can we walk down the street to a nice little bar that we know and have drinks and talk like we were in college? Can we try that? And we did that. We didn't walk down the street together. We met there at the, at the bar and drank wine and talked for what was supposed to be about an hour and ended up being about three because we were actually talking as two artists, as peers, without any of that staff stuff, without any of what that hierarchical feeling that comes with being in the artistic director's office. So I don't know if that's something that we can all adopt, but I think going to a bar and drinking wine and talking is so much more useful in terms of having a relationship with an artistic director that's real, that allows you to question each other, that allows you not to have that, that press of all the other stuff that they're doing while you're trying to talk as an artist. So I, I recommend bars and wine drinking for conversation as opposed to going to the office. Um, and that's really brilliant. Um, we, uh, it's interesting, I had this great epiphany when I was working at New Dramatists, and, and my, my, my role at New Dramatists was very different than Susan's at the Alliance, because Susan is producing and she's curating, and I was really there to, to you know, work with the writers and facilitate community among the writers. And I realized that writers would come to my office often, and I would panic because I had a schedule and a list of things I had to get done that day, or I knew I had a meeting in 10 minutes or whatever, and they were showing up in my office when their writing day was done when it was over and it was time to hang. And they were in the church and they, and suddenly I realized that there was a cultural, we were talking across cultures of time usage as well. And, um, and even on the staff, um, you know, it is so hard as you were probably witnessing in the theater to keep focused on the art when all the demands of administration and funding and um, group dynamics, staff dynamics, personnel, policy, all these things are going on. Um, my uh, former associate colleague, and now my uh, successor at New Dramatist, Emily Morse, instituted a very similar thing with me, where we would go to a diner, and we would just, she would call them jam sessions, and we would just talk about things that were not in the office, that were really talking more and more about things we'd seen, things we'd read, things we were talking about, and just to try to do that uphill thing of having artistic conversations in and out of institutional contexts. So that's a brilliant, and wine, yeah, wine and chocolate. question or a statement, so I'm going to say it. How do playwrights who are so used to 
carrying their suitcases. How do they make their artistic home in a theater when they're so used to being itinerant and not making themselves at home? <coughs> uh, I think that is the question I actually put to the group and you as well, Todd, is, is how do we learn to settle in? And how can the playwrights take a role in learning how to do that? Because I think that's something I struggle with and how can the theaters maybe learn to help us like as I was saying to these guys, like we're feral cats, you know? How do we learn how to root ourselves? Does that make sense? I, uh, I, do. Um, <laughs> I, I know that's a question for you, and uh, I, I figured you have two days to talk about it there, so I'll just say what I think. Um, I, um, I think it's a real, it calls for a real change from the writers. Um, and I, I will uh, call upon my experience at New Dramatists. Uh, it was, um, we talked a lot at New Dramatists, and Dan LaFranc is there, and he can second, second this. We talked a lot about leadership and uh, ownership and playwrights really taking charge of their lives and the, leading the theater, and even within the context of a playwright's um, seven-year residency at New Dramatists, really owning the organization. And I, I felt it to be, and this is no surprise, a uh, secret, an uphill battle. Because playwrights are used to um, dipping in, they're used to being guests, they're used to um, blaming others for, for the situation that they find themselves in sometimes. And it's, it's a hard life that demands and requires a kind of freedom and a kind of isolation and a kind of footlooseness which is also freedom, um, but I think it also fosters a sense of like, I don't really own this place. I am, I'm not really a leader. The leaders are the people in the artistic director's office, as Phil put it. Um, but I think um, it's a little bit up to you, Julie. I mean, in a way to um, put your suitcase down, to unpack it, to make demands of the theater, to say, and, and I know it's really hard because it is, a change of everything you have done and trained yourself to do over all these years, and maybe it's wrong for you, and maybe at the end of the three years you'll find out, man, I hate this, I, I'm getting my suitcase together, and I'm gonna go on the road, um, but I don't think, um, I don't think it's simply about the theater's invitation. That said, I also think it, uh, just hearing that question must be really powerful for the artistic leader and directors in the room because, um, you know, to me so much of this really is that when you live in a space, whether it's an administrative space or a solo playwriting space, you start to think the world is the same as your world, and it's not. And Susan's world is different than Pearl's world, and your world is different than Mark's world, and so we just don't have enough brain space or time to always be empathizing or entering the space of the other and to really understand, oh, here's Julie Maya. She has never sat down in one place for longer than three days. What can I do, you know? And that's where, I mean, there's part of me that's like, take Pearl's idea, but instead of having wine outside of the office, you know, host dinners in the theater. You know, you, you, Julie, do what you would do in your own home. You know, Dale Orlander Smith used to come into New Dramas, and every time she came, she'd bring a cake that she baked. <laughs> and we knew when Dale was in the house that there was this really big, really delicious cake on the round table in the library. So part of it is about you um, saying, what would I do in my own home to welcome other people, and then cooking. six of them in my head, but maybe speaking as a founder, I'm not sure, I'm looking around the room to see, there may be other theater founders in the room, but I'm certainly one of them. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to me, you know, this phenomenon that the American regional theaters 
Uh, many of them had director founders. I actually wasn't one of them. I was an actor, and then I became a director through founding a theater. I mean, nobody said that playwrights couldn't found theaters or actors couldn't or designers couldn't. I've gotten to know Dmitry Kremlov's work in Russia recently. He's a, essentially a designer who now has become a director and a, and a theater founder uh, and one of the great uh, theater makers in the world. Um, so I'm interested, you know, especially now that you're in a, uh, in, a, in a research institution, I'm interested in what the history, you know, that recent history in the United States of directors taking those leadership roles are, whether that trend may be changing, um, and, and I think that in a way we shouldn't um, sort of uh, assume that the conversation is always about a, a director welcoming in, you know, as artistic director welcoming in uh, playwrights and also providing a home for, frankly, technicians and actors, at, you know, all the different people who it takes to make theater. I also like to think about the marketing people as artists and, and the fundraisers as artists as well. So it takes a village. Um, but I'm just curious how that history has evolved and how it might evolve in the United States. And it would be very interesting to document, you know, role reversals in that situation. I mean, Tim is not a director. He's a, a literary manager. Ari Roth at Theater J is a playwright. All of those uh, maybe uh, tweaks of the system and the structure might be very fascinating over the next many decades as we see our very young experiment continue to play out in new ways. I think it's a really good question. I think it's also an interesting question for someone like Che, who's in the room, because you know he's this divided guy. You know, as a director and a playwright, and and, uh, and an artistic director as well. You know, what does it mean to be multiple selves, and what can be um, contained within the structure, an ongoing daily structure of a theater? I mean, I think there are. I think it's really important to look beyond the institutional theater too for models. There, I mean, I think of like. Um, uh, Kirk at uh, Rude Max as kind of a co-artistic director and playwright in the same way that Lee Brewer was at Mabu Mines. Um, you know, people like Charles Ludlum who were playwright directors who founded their own theaters more in the tradition of Moliere and, you know, the Greeks and pretty much everybody who led to that were either actors or directors. I mean, I would... It, you know, I, I, I think it's a really great question for scholarship and for research. I also think it's a really great, great question institutionally and for, um, for the executive search firms to really grapple with, with boards because boards tend to understand the way directors speak. Playwrights have tended to remove themselves from the running of theaters more and more because they feel they can't, the theaters are too complicated and they can't do their work. You know, Emily Mann is a different example, but I would, I would ask people like Che and Emily, do you get any writing done? When do you write? How has it changed your writing? Um, uh, and also what are, you know, as boards have populated the leadership, why are they choosing directors more and more? And why are managers, theater managers, seemingly more comfortable with directors than maybe with other people? Um, I mean, Tim, I, I'm curious, you used Tim as an example, because I met Tim when he was directing. And like me, he stopped directing. And I don't know, was that so that he could run theaters or do the area? That'd be a great question for the room. Thanks a lot.